We always celebrate many heroes of our country, whether in sports, the arts, or even political heroes who have left this world. While this is a great exercise to help in shaping the society's character and develop future leaders in those sectors, we have been neglecting heroes who have walked among us. It has always troubled me how we have always celebrated people who have never met us. But once we lay our beloved ones to rest, we forget them and the impact they have had on us and the lessons they have left us. This lecture series is my way of correcting that. This is the third, this is the fourth installment of these impact lectures. And today we are looking at a life of a man who was more than a mentor, but was my father. It was the hardest lecture to prepare. Let's talk about that. Pastor Jacob again. The pain of losing my father will never subside. It is pacified by what he taught about the dead that those who believe in Jesus will not die but have eternal life. If it was not of that belief, I don't know how I would have taken it and how, how I would have managed to deal with it. And so today, every time the pain comes, I'm reminded that we shall meet in glory. My father raised us from the word of God. When I look at my life, I see the enactment of the Proverbs in, in chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in a way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. He did his utmost best to guide us towards Christ. The best lesson he gave us was when he lived the life. If there was any fault in my father's life, I never saw it. Up to this day, I can't point to one thing out that would be a black mark in his character. That's a man who lived what he preached. When he passed on, I wrote a poem where I shared my impression on the man he was. The poem is a summary of the tribute I want to pay to him. I present here a running commentary on the poem. Data, you raised the soldier in me, so my tears will have to bear with me, for I will not weep. You were extraordinary. I have no time for tears. My father taught us about a home in glory. Um, some of his favorite songs would talk about a life beyond this life. Mapesheya, it was one of his favorite. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, lift up your voice and sing. He always reminded us that there's a life beyond this life. And what we, will, we should be striving for is living life so that we could qualify for that life where everlasting joy shall be our lifetime, lifestyle. Death has always been an event where we were expected, we expected as it translated us to a better life. This teaching helped me to deal better with the loss. The poem continues. Your life 
was a colossal stature and I will wake every moment celebrating it. Now when my father passed, I realized how we never celebrate those we love when they leave. I thought of my grandfather who had a massive influence of me, but I neglected his memory when he left. And so I made a decision. Those who live with us, when they leave, we shall remember their memories. We shall celebrate what they've done in our lives. This will never be this must never be mistaken with communication with the dead. I'm well aware that those that are this side can never speak to those on the other side. It's a, it's a belief I hold. Those who've left to earth are gone. We can never talk to them. They can never talk to us. However, their memory remains. And we, do, we need to celebrate that. It's strange that we are able to celebrate Oliver Tambo, Nelson Mandela, Steve Biko, and those guys died long ago. But whenever we celebrate them, we, we think, ah, great, we're celebrating heroes. But when it comes to those we knew, we shy away. Why? We need to start celebrating them. And through this project, I, I plan to celebrate more people who've lived in my life. I know some, when some people pass on, you just make a decision, I need to do something for them. I can think of many friends and mentors who left And I said in my heart, I need to do something to celebrate their life. And so my life is a collection of celebrating the lives of people. I've got a, pro a project called The Oliver Tambo, where we celebrate the lives of leaders, politicians, who've gone, Chris Hahn, Oliver Tambo, uh, Winnie Mandela. It's beautiful. But I shall be creating another platform to celebrate people that have lived and made a difference among us. The, um, my father was a people's person. He was a source of strength for many who came to him for cancer. Our house was a consultation space. People would knock, and they'd have a long conversation where he comforted them, guided them. He loved without pretense. A love he spread equally to everyone he met. If ever a pastor was a person, my father was. He possessed genuine love. Your standards are too high. How are we to emulate you? One of the things you do as a child is try to emulate your father. It's an achievement to look at your life and see a reflection of your father. His life is going to be hard to emulate. That is why the phrase, if I could be half the man that he was, I would have achieved, applies to me. If I could be half the man that he was, I would have made progress in this pursuit of emulating such a man. Your love for your wife was golden to behold. You loved her more than life, let truth be told. This is one of the most lofty legacies my father taught us. He loved my mother. Their loved affair went for over, for 44, for over 40 years. Ever hot, no sign of going down. My childhood is filled with the vision of a man who loved his wife. Sometimes I see children grow up without fathers. Children complaining that my father was a monster. I've not, I don't know what that feels like. We lived with a man who was warm towards us. And his warmth was mainly directed at, at, at his wife. And we just felt the love and it, it groomed us. You were one of the strongest men I knew. Studious in the garden, laborious. Studious in the study, laborious in the garden, creative in the kitchen. Your painful upbringing prompted a working man out of you. One never to complain when a task had to be carried out, for you were content in who you are and never hid behind titles and positions. One of the lessons I learned from him was the ability to fit in every environment without trying to impose your position on people in that environment. 
Some people would get to a place and they want to be known immediately that I'm a pastor, I'm a bishop, I'm an apostle. My father was just a man. Sometimes people would ignore him, not knowing who he really is, until they are informed who he is, then they start trying to give him attention. When there was a pride, he would make the fire and pry the meat, even as he was the general secretary of a 200 branches church and pastor of a local church. He never feared his reputation would be soiled by going down to serve at tables. He enjoyed serving at tables. He was at home in the kitchen and would rise to create great dishes for the family at times. He disdained the view that a woman's place is in the kitchen. When I heard about how he grew up without a father and his uncle mistreating him, one would have expected an angry man, which he was not. He just became a hard worker and he became a loving dad. You were a true gentleman whose word was your honor. Remembered for the life you lived, the influence you had, the jokes you made, the songs you sang, the advice you gave. You went beyond teaching about life. You imparted greatness in me. He had the ability to connect with greatness. His name gave us a cloud. People will respect me because I am Nyageni's child. His name was a balwak for my gallop. His name was a balwak for my gallop. Sometimes people would not take you seriously until someone said, Umtanagam Nyage. That's the type of name that he carried. Do they still make men like you? I ask. The institution of men has been soiled by various acts by some men who've been doing trashy things. This has spared a movement that brands men as trash. This movement refuses to note the exceptions. If you raise the exceptions, they brand you as trash. But they give an impression that the issue is not criminals and trashy men who are acting in wrong ways. They, they, they think the issue is manhood. Thus, they spread this disdain to every man. I ask daily, do they still make men like Udad, who was a, a picture of what a man should be? With such men, I will never accept the maxim that men are trash. I insist there are men who are. My poem continues, for we could have done with a couple of more years to learn how to be at ease with dignitaries and still be able to converse with those of lesser means. Your humility in serving others was Christ-like. You always put others first and never complained when they derided you. With little at your disposal, you built a strong family, carved a supporting home environment for us. I once, very early in my life, I once saw the pay slip of my father when he was still at the employ of Pilkington. Tears fell my, on, off my eyes when I realized he's providing so much out of so little. I realized there's a magical ability that, that our parents uh, have to multiply little into much. I knew for a fact that my father was a praying man. The only explanation I could fathom was that, like the little boy with two fishes and five loaves of bread he gave to Jesus. He took his children through school, into tertiary. He was gracious even in that space. One of the Christian fathers of Guatemala uh, Dr. Richard Nteto once spoke about how my father surrendered his car to him as he needed it more with the work he had started building. What a man. Even though he was strict and principled, he gave us space to make our mistakes. He managed that contradiction so well. Even though he was strict, very strict, he managed to allow us space to make our mistakes from which we also learned. The legacy you left is massive, but you gave us tips to deal with life. When it seemed, it seemed to be overwhelming, you're one in a million, a man who lived all the days of his life. 
This phrase, a man who lives on the days of life, was crafted by my brother when we were preparing for my father's funeral to, en- to, en- to engrave in his, in, his, in his tomb. It's an apt description of the man. He lived all the days of his life. Firstly, because 70, he lived beyond 70, an age many believe is a given period of life. My grandfather used to say anything beyond 70 is a bonus. He finished 70 years of life and lived a couple after that. Secondly, and most importantly, he lived fully all the days of his life. There was no sense of regret in him. Even the difficult periods of his life had meaning. He was never bitter. He praised God in every situation, moaning and groaning and complaining, only still important days from your life. Live every day grateful. Live every day of your life. God is in control. And I conclude the poem by saying, that you are dearly missed, but we find comfort in knowing we will see you in the morning. If there are three lessons I learned from my father, they are the following. One, humility. He was humble. He was not obsessed with being in the limelight. He had sufficient self-esteem to stand at the back and enjoy the ministry of others. He founded a Bible school that had over 200 graduates every year from various corners of life. Yet he never assumed and wanted to to share space with the fathers or apostles or founders, whatever they are known as. He remained a humble servant of God. The second lesson was his straightforwardness. Even in his humble demeanor, he was a straight talker who understood that straight talk doesn't break any friendships. An example of that was that many people, when they leave a church, they just disappear until they have formed that church. Then they come back and say, well, I've left. He went to Newcastle, spent two days, had a meeting with Obaba, explained to him why he's leaving. And he's starting a new work, which he did, which God blessed during the days of his life. He was not one to bend bridges. He said exactly what he wanted to say. And the third trait about him was that he was wise. In my lecture on Baba Ntombela, I spoke about how Baba embodied the biblical gift of wisdom. Tata possessed that gift as well. He spoke only when necessary and was full of guiding questions. When you present an issue to him, you would respond with a question. The question would help you to maneuver your way towards a solution. He has guided many in their travels. He was frequently counseling, coaching, mentoring people who needed, who needed his wisdom. He was soft-spoken, but his words carried power. I thank God I managed to glean from the life of this great man in many conversations that we had. He demonstrated total service culture. He gave his all in everything he did. I'm told that as a youth, he was a photographer, a preacher, youth leader, music director at the AFM. Multi-skilled he was, a trait I've embraced with no shame. One of the most touching engagements I had with him was when I came across a view that was contrary to what I've been taught all my life on doctrine. It was a discovery that would shake my roots. When I discussed it with him, He did not dismiss me, but engaged in his own research. Came back to tell me, Sipo, you are correct. We have been teaching error in this area. Few fathers would accept the change to change a view based on questions from their sons. What a man. His personal motto, which was the vision of the church he founded, was Hosea 4 verse 6. My people perish for lack of knowledge. This text guided his ever-searching attitude, testing all things and holding on to what was good. He was passionate with seeing church leaders speak from a position of knowledge so they won't mislead people. My father was a great man. I would have done enough if I would be half a man 
that he was. Vunja Malanga, what a man.